Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Total Biscuit. This video could be seen as jumping on the bandwagon, I suppose, and that might be true if this wasn't something we'd covered quite a bit. But even if it were true, it wouldn't really matter, because this is a bandwagon that needs to be jumped on. This is the sort of thing that needs to have people actually caring about it and not allowing this particular set of circumstances to become the new normal. And some might argue that we're already there. We've passed the point of no return. Maybe. Maybe we have. But let's talk about it anyway, shall we? Because regardless of whether or not that is the case, I don't think simply sitting idly by and allowing it to happen is useful in any way. We're going to talk about loot boxes, and we're going to talk about how they have evolved. And I'm sure some people will say, well, it was obviously Overwatch that popularized the concept of it. It may very well be the game that popularized the modern iteration of it, but this kind of thing's been going on for a long time, especially with physical and then digital card games. We were in an interesting position with digital card games in that when they started to offer packs of these things for real money, Quite a few of us said, well, you know what, this is how it's always been. This is simply a replication of the physical system. In reality, of course, that wasn't really true. The physical system provided a physical product, a product that could be traded or sold freely. A product in which you could buy a single card that you specifically wanted simply by having the money for it or trade it for something of equal value. In the case of Magic the Gathering, the reason that that hasn't been regulated, the reason why it hasn't been labelled as gambling, is because you are getting something of guaranteed value out of the packet. And compared to actual gambling, in which you put in money and may very well get nothing in return, it's a little different. And legislation in many countries seems to agree with that particular concept. They do not view the idea of a blind box in the same way that they view actual monetary gambling. Now, perhaps it is time for that to change. When we heard about the CSGO lotto scandal, it blew open an industry of real gambling, trading virtual items for real money, and being able to also trade it outside of the ecosystem in which it was bought. That's a very key difference between something like, say, Hearthstone or Overwatch, and something like CSGO. With CSGO, you can sell your items within the Steam ecosystem for store credit, but there are also many, many ways in which to cash out by using third-party websites. And while some of the loopholes have certainly been plugged, there are plenty more that have sprung up in its place. Valve has a real problem with actual gambling, and they may very well bring down the full might of a country's government on top of their heads if they don't watch it, and I'm sure they're keenly aware of that. With games like Overwatch and Hearthstone and other titles that utilize a cosmetic loot box system, you can't trade outside of the system. And in many ways, that actually makes buying loot boxes an even worse value proposition. You can end up getting something that you don't want that you then can't get rid of for anything of actual value. The best thing you can do in some cases is to disenchant said item. And in Hearthstone, you could disenchant any card you want. But in Overwatch, you can only receive credit that you can then spend on the skin you actually want by having a duplicate of a skin you already own. So if you don't want any more of that goth Zarya, then, well, you're fresh out of luck unless you continue to pull duplicates and then slowly, at a fairly terrible exchange rate, let's be honest, trade it for the thing that you actually want. It's a bad value proposition, but a lot of us have been relatively okay with it because we're dealing with a closed system where there is no real money involved in actual gambling and we're dealing with cosmetic items only that do not affect the actual gameplay. But, of course, slopes have a tendency to be slippery every once in a while. A fallacy it may be, but not always. And in this case, this is the year. This is the year when the idea of the loot box which actually affects gameplay managed to make the jump from mobile gaming, where it has been for a while, and to some extent, of course, also many Asian titles that essentially invented the concept of pay to win a long, long time ago, and then taken it into the mainstream with AAA titles. There are two big examples we're going to be talking about today. One is Star Wars Battlefront 2, 
with its star card system. And the other is Shadow of War, which is a forthcoming primarily single player game, which has also included loot boxes, out of which you can get legendary orcs. I mean, oh god, the, the, the whole concept of even just saying that makes me roll my eyes. Tolkien would certainly be rolling in his grave, there's no doubt about that. But this is, in my eyes, the big test of whether or not we are willing to accept these kind of things in our games. And unfortunately, I think it's very likely that we will. If we look at the first Star Wars Battlefront, despite it being a pretty damn shallow game with very little to actually keep you playing, that game sold 12 damn million copies. It's absolutely absurd. Despite people knowing that it wasn't that great, despite people having played the beta and said, you know what, this, is, this isn't particularly good, well, people bought it anyway in droves. And in this case, I have a feeling that both of these games are going to sell very, very well. And they would hardly be the first ones to have done so. This is what we need to bear in mind. EA in particular has been pushing these boundaries for the last few years, and they've been doing it through their sports games. FIFA, NBA, Madden. These are titles that include the mode Ultimate Team, which allows you to build a powerful team, I guess. Would you call them powerful? Sure, why not? A very high stat team of famous players in order to beat other players. And these games actually had loot box packs to get these ultra-powerful players several years prior to these systems making their way into core titles. Was that on purpose? Was that a deliberate effort? Were they testing the waters with perhaps a more casual player base that would be less aware of these kind of practices? Possibly. But it's very clear that EA has had the intention of trying to shoehorn this stuff into their games for a long time. With their core titles, they've dabbled in it a little bit, but they've always tried to stay on the line of acceptability. If we look at Mass Effect 3 and Mass Effect Andromeda's multiplayer, they also had loot boxes. You could open these packs and they would contain characters and upgrades and all sorts of things like that. However, the way they got away with it was by saying, well, it's actually a cooperative game. So in reality, it's not hurting anybody. If somebody is more powerful than you, all that's going to do is actually help you. So there's no reason for you to really complain. They managed to pull that off for the most part, it would seem. I didn't notice a huge amount of complaining about that. And those multiplayer games continue to be very popular. I played a good amount of them and I can't say that they really negatively affected my gameplay experience. But let's be honest, they really shouldn't have been there in the first place. And unfortunately, it would seem that now they have tested the waters, figured out, yeah, people will accept this. Let's see if we can go all out on it, especially on a very popular product, which is exactly what Battlefront is. A lot of hype behind it. If it sells anywhere close to the first one, it will shift millions of copies. Now, for those who don't know, the way that the Star Wars Battlefront system works is you acquire your skills not through the regular means of leveling up and just unlocking them, you get them in boxes, because that's apparently all we're allowed to do now. You get them at random, and you get different levels of them. There are level 1, 2, 3, and 4 cards, and the difference in power between these is fairly large. Now, before I show you some of this and give you some examples of just how insane this can get, I'd like to point out that even if they were not, even if these were just 1% here, 2% there, little edges, that's still explicitly, objectively, by the very definition of the term, pay to win. If you are able to buy a power advantage over somebody else, especially early on, when people are very much still leveling up, they don't have a lot of cards and options to play with, that is by definition pay to win. There is really no way around it. There have been some efforts to mitigate this sort of thing. For instance, Clash Royale, which was a game I played a lot of, and frankly, I will admit that I spent a lot of money on. I, I enjoyed the game a lot. But in order to compete at the higher levels, you really had to be either playing eight or nine hours a day minimum in order to earn what you needed, or buy. And usually it was buy, because the game worked on a trophy system. If you lost a game, you lost trophies, and that means you could actually 
lose rank. If you wanted to maintain your rank, you needed units, especially the newest ones that were in the meta. If you didn't have access to them, you are in serious trouble. But then they also had card levels. So even if you had the unit, if you didn't have it in an appropriate level, the other guy, let's say you had level 12 archers and you had level 8 archers, you would be at an objective disadvantage. And in the case of Clash Royale, it was like 10% per level in terms of health and damage. So it actually racked up pretty damn quickly. Now, the way that that game solved the problem was by having a pretty huge player base and trying to match you only with people that had the same level stuff as you did. Here's the thing about that. If the game does that, then yes, it solves the problem of imbalance. But then what the hell was the point in giving you these upgrades in the first place? That's the quandary of this whole system. In order to make it fair, you literally have to make it pointless. Ergo, the entire reason for it existing is moot. That's why I hate the notion of these incremental upgrades right off the bat. Locking options that are potentially side grades and choices behind loot boxes, or preferably just straight unlocks, that's less of a big deal than unlocking straight power upgrades. Unlocking better versions of something, objectively better versions. You can't argue balance there. One is numerically superior to the other, and there is no getting around that. Let me show you, with a little bit of footage from the beta, just what has ended up happening here. Now bear in mind, of course, this is the beta, there is time for change, and frankly, I hope that with enough noise, this sort of thing will end up getting changed, but frankly, it would end up dismantling the entire level system at bare minimum in order to fix this. So let's just say I don't have a lot of faith in them doing that. All right, welcome to Star Wars Battlefront 2's beta as of the 8th of October. Now I'm going to show you how the system works, how unlocks work, and then just demonstrate how ridiculous some of these combinations can get when it comes to powering you up versus other people in the game. Before I go on, a little side note. Really? This is the thing you want confronting people as soon as they load your game for the first time. <laughs> How obnoxious. Not quite as bad, perhaps, as the DLC vendor in the Dragon Age Origins camp, but really, have a little bit of self-respect, come on. Alright. Let's head to collection. So, every one of these classes, including the stuff that you can unlock as rewards for earning battle points in the middle of matches, so... If you do objectives, you earn battle points. Once you've got enough, you can play as one of these. You can grab an interceptor or a bomber or even a hero if you have enough battle points for it. And each of these has their own set of loadouts, because of course it does. These are the basic classes. This is what you're going to be spending the majority of your time on. But these are the heroes. And they have their own separate loadouts too. This is where things get a little bit ridiculous. Now, when you open the crates, these are relatively harmless. Obviously. Victory poses, emotes. Although I have to say, if you end up with one of these, this is more of an insult than anything else. Because, of course, you want useful star cards. You don't want poses and emotes. Absolute nonsense. I don't know where all the cosmetics are in this game. It makes me think that Disney had something to do with this. Because we noticed very little cosmetic customization in the first one either. That seems like a really easy way to make some extra money without annoying too many people. Well, you could do all sorts of things with customization. Don't tell me that selling fancy colored lightsabers and different armor and helmets for troops wouldn't be a good money spinner. It would, and frankly, that would be a great way to implement loot boxes. But that's not in the game for whatever reason, and we're stuck with this. So each of these classes has three star card slots that are unlockable by levels. Now, at the moment, the worst thing is that these levels actually go up depending on how many cards you have. So, in theory, if the system operates the way that it does in the beta at launch, you could start the game, immediately buy a bunch of loot boxes for real money, which isn't available in the beta, but we know is going to be in the main game. Power up one of these characters to unlock the extra slots, slot in some level 3 and 4 abilities, and then go to town on people with massive advantages. Now, in terms of the heroes, yes, you don't get to play these all that often, but some of the power you can get here is obscene. So, we'll have a look at what we have here. Small selection of boost cards. I imagine they're going to add more, because of course there's a monetary incentive to do so. Why would they not? You're going to get people to buy more boxes if you keep adding more skills and cards into the game. That's why the system's there. Make no mistake, they realized it's sustainable and it's a good money spinner. So here's a great example. We're going to head on over to this one. Death from above. Now, 
by default, with Rocket Barrage, you go up and you fire a bunch of rockets. Now, if you equip this, this is going to reduce the amount of damage you take while under Rocket Barrage. So at level 1, it's 50%. Sounds pretty good. At level 4, it's 100%. You are literally invincible. That is a massive difference. A absolutely huge one. Literal invulnerability that you either have to spend a bunch of time grinding for. You get these shards here, as you can see. I might as well spend one to craft level 1 here. Because I happen to have these shards. There we go. You can see. There we go. We've leveled this up here. And I can equip it. It actually, if I recall correctly, uh, when I just uh, hit that button, it also said that by crafting that card, that would actually level up Boba Fett. So that's a good demonstration of how that system works. So there's 50%. Upgrade to level 2, it's 80 shards, and then god knows what. I mean, we really don't know how much work this is going to take to get these abilities up to level 4, but since there are so many damn loadouts, I imagine that getting everything up to level 4 is going to take a ton of time. So, obviously, opening boxes is going to be easier, but it's invulnerability versus not invulnerability. That is quite obviously a big deal. And, of course, once you start adding in a few more of these cards, you know, increased fire rate from 30% to 70% on rocket fire... And all that sort of thing. Concussion grenade. You can concuss up to an additional four seconds with this. Once you've got these levels for these... Yeah, it did. It leveled Boba Fett up to level two. So that's exactly how it works. Once you've got these, you're going to be a murder boss compared to people that don't. Now, if we have a look at classes here, where you're going to be spending the majority of your time, you can see, you know, well, how egregious is this? Well, this may be a little bit more sane, but as you can see at the moment, there are very few options available, which makes me think there are going to be a lot more coming your way. In this case, you've got Resourceful here. All of your abilities have faster recharge times. Sounds pretty good, right? Yeah, it does. So if we grab that, and then we could, of course, boost that up to 28% versus 10%. That may on paper not sound like a lot, but that's actually fairly significant. And bear in mind, you can combine it with other things. So, if we have a look at, say, Vanguard Refresh, let's say you grab that, and suddenly not only do you have faster recharge times, but you also have this, where you are killing enemies, and it is reducing, it is refreshing those abilities. And then, of course, the recharge time of this goes down, combine it with this, suddenly this is even more powerful than it was in the first place. Combat Enhancer. All this kind of thing. These are the sort of things you can combine together. Now, the most egregious examples of these combinations of stacking come with interceptors and fighters. So, if we have a look at fighters, what you'll see here is you've got a straight-up damage multiplier bonus. 10% at maximum versus 2%. Again, on paper, you might not think that sounds like a lot, but it is. It really is. And then, if you start to combine it with other things such as overheat cooldown reduction, then you are able to not only do more damage, but you spend less time not firing, meaning that your effective DPS has massively increased. You can also, of course, make yourself tougher by reducing the recharge rate of the defensive upgrades, increasing the regeneration speed of your repair systems, stacking all of this up to make an absolute beast mode of a fighter versus somebody else. Go to Interceptor. There's some other good examples here. I have Offensive Upgrade. I also have Fire Control Cycler. Take that up, 20% fire rate increase. That's 20% extra DPS right there. Combine that with Overheat Reduction. Again, you are firing more and more than your opponent is if they don't have this. And then, of course, you can add in things like your Offensive Upgrades, Advanced Capacitors, and everything just gets better. One of the biggest examples of a huge upgrade was in Bomber Health. Now, if we head on over here, you will see Reinforced Hull. Look at this. This can't be right, surely. At level 1, you get 5% health multiplied. At level 4, you get 40? 40%? Good lord. Combine that with a defensive upgrade. Look at this. 15% at level 1 health recovery. 100% at level 4. Good lord, and bombers aren't even that expensive. You're seeing the problem here. And even if 
we were to make the argument that, oh, it's not that much, even if that were true, which it's not because you can stack this stuff, it would still be an objective advantage over other people. It is, by definition, in every sense of the word, pay to win. What other way is there to look at it? I don't... You can't defend it. It is indefensibly pay to win. And the question is whether or not you're okay with it being pay to win. Because, hey, I got a bunch of money. I go in on day one, buy a bunch of boxes, and just go murder people for a week. I can have my little power fantasy. And you know what? As someone that has to critique the game, it would probably be quite advantageous for me if I did that. Because then my footage would look all impressive and everything. But in reality, of course, I got that because I have a bunch of level four cards and guys with three slots unlocked, whereas everybody else is stuck with one or two. And some arguments can be made and are often made that, well, it's just a way for people to catch up. In this case, it clearly is not. And the problem is, if there was a clear separation between the people that had a lot of time and the people that had a lot of money, would be okay. The problem is, some people have quite a bit of both. So they're able to combine not only the time, which means they've unlocked more stuff, and of course they're better at the game through sheer practice, with money that means that they get the best upgrades, and then it just becomes a snowball effect. People just get better and better and better and better at it. And the gap gets wider and wider. Now, I can think of a few ways to at least put the brakes on some of this. For instance, I would suggest that we look at a system like, say, what Paladins has. For those who don't know, and I'll show this on the screen right now from some of my older footage. Bear in mind, Paladins looks way different now. This is early beta footage. You are able to pick a couple of different upgrades, passive for the most part, and you could pick from level 1 up to level 4. Everybody had access to these right from the get-go. And there was a loadout point system whereby you could only equip a certain number of points of stuff. So, if you wanted a, level, a bunch of level 4 cards, you may have to pass up on something else. You might have to say, lower the level of something else. Or you could have a more balanced loadout where everything's at like level 2 and maybe there's a level 3 in there. So you were able to make choices there. Now, if you did that here, then you could, say, force people to uh, not have level 4 of everything. That would probably help. I think that would, that would help balance things out a little bit. It sure as hell wouldn't fix the problem of, oh, I paid to win on day one and got three slots in everything because I unlocked a bunch of cards. And it wouldn't solve the problem of people, of course, having level four stuff before other people do. And in the case of things like Boba Fett or indeed the Bomber, you can see the massive difference between level three and four. But it would at least put the brakes on this so that people aren't able to stack hugely powerful combinations of cards. And I really honestly believe the only way to do this fairly, if you are going to insist on the loot box thing, the only way to do this fairly is to take the levels away completely. Make the abilities unlockable. You know, there are replacement abilities in this game, quite a few. If we go to Officer, I can demonstrate that. For instance, I took Diffuser instead of something else. That's an ability replacement card. So that takes away my flash grenade. So I'm having to make a choice here between one thing and another. This is not objectively better than flash grenade. So that in itself is pretty cool. This is Battle Command Strike. So in, if I understand this correctly, Battle Command Strike improves people's weapon cooling so they could just open fire. Battle Command makes them tougher. So this is a choice. These are fine. These are good. These are the kind of choices that people want in their loadouts. But of course, then you see the leveled up versions of them and all that kind of thing, and the whole thing falls to pieces. Now, ideally, you wouldn't put those behind loot boxes either, because limiting people's options is still a problem. That still puts them at a disadvantage. But these are more like side grades, and I can tolerate that kind of progression. I don't think it's brilliant, but I can tolerate it. The way that they've done it here is essentially intolerable. It's blatantly 100% without any question pay to win. I don't see how you can argue against that. The question is, are we going to accept that? Well, a lot of people are. And even if all of us, everyone that watched this video, everyone that was aware of this video decided not to buy, it might make a bit of a dent. But the sad thing is that it's not going to make a difference. This game's going to sell millions. You know what the really sad thing is? That after playing the beta, I actually really quite enjoyed it. 
Compared to the original, I think it's much, much better. The map, they could have definitely picked a better one for it, but the objective-based play and the way the classes work, that and the way that they synergize and buff each other, made me feel like I was really part of a squad, part of an army, and working towards a goal. And of course, there was a huge different selection of vehicles and heroes that I could access, and taking away that random power-up system from the first game, I think was a great idea as well. If the game sucked, I would be much less upset about this. Problem is, it doesn't suck. It's actually quite entertaining, and this system just... It's not even a blemish. It's covering it in goop. It's... Ugh, it's horrible. It's flat-out horrible. Now, we've covered Battlefront 2 quite a lot. We haven't really touched upon Shadow of War. The problem with Shadow of War right now is that currently we are relying on the opinions of a select few reviewers. Warner Brothers is really quite select, let's just say, with who it gives access to. And I am not on that list because I have criticized the hell out of them and they do not like that. I can't remember the last time I got a review code for a Warner Brothers game. In fact, I don't think I actually ever have. No, no, that's not true. I think they gave me a code for Gotham City Imposters at one point. <laughs> Great. Now, in Shadow of War, we are having to rely on these opinions, and those opinions are split as to what loot boxes actually do. I mean, it is a single-player game. So, what kind of effect could a loot box possibly have? Well, the first thing is it could affect the pacing of the game. Now, reviewers have generally reported that the first three acts of the game are not affected by loot boxes. They felt no need to buy them, the game was just fine, there wasn't really a problem with it. But, Act 4, which is Shadow Wars, which is a larger, longer kind of meta mode, which involves a lot of fortress conquest and defense, which, by the way, you need to play and beat in order to get the true ending. A couple of outlets have reported that that can turn into a pretty massive grind if you do not buy loot boxes. It is possible to get these legendary orcs in the game world, but it will take a lot of effort versus just buying the boxes. I have a feeling that a lot of these reviewers didn't even get to Chapter 4, which is why only a couple of outlets like Polygon and GameSpot actually mentioned this at all. So, it seems that in that mode, it certainly has affected the balance of the game. It has clearly turned that part of the game into an absolute grindfest, unless you buy loot boxes, if those reviewers are to be believed. We're not going to know that, of course, until the game actually comes out and we're able to crack through for ourselves and see just how true it really is. It's hard to know. It's hard to say, really. But the seeds are there. The suspicions are there. The fact that that's already been pointed out is clearly an issue. And, of course, none of these reviewers were able to play the multiplayer mode, which is a fortress assault and fortress defense style mode in which players can attack you and you can attack them and take over forts and all sorts of things like that. Well, there's a problem with that mode as well. There are two forms of it. There's a ranked mode, and there is an unranked mode. Now, in unranked mode, it's basically just for fun. You can attack fortresses, there's really no harm if you end up losing. It's all okay. In the ranked mode, which is where things get really quite egregious, not only can you use things that you have bought from loot boxes, but your orcs can permanently die. So, your best orcs can be wiped off the map, and you'll have to replace them. Now, of course, that turns the mode once again into something of a grind, but it also means that if you wish to be competitive in this ranked mode, the best thing you can do is to buy loot boxes. So, we've gone right back around to this concept of pay to win. Now, is it as much of a problem as it is in Battlefront? Well, probably not, no, because I imagine that only the small minority are actually going to play this. You know, this is going to be the rich man's playground, as it were. But... It's still there, it's still an issue, and they're clearly trying to slip all of that under the radar right now, and I'm not really a huge fan of it. Now, one thing that we really haven't touched upon, despite mentioning that most countries do not consider this particular form of doing things as actual gambling, is the idea that regardless of it not being legally gambling, it certainly has all the aspects of gambling and, most importantly, the psychological triggers and dopamine release that can be found from gambling. You probably felt it yourself. I have. Here's an example. I spent a lot of money on a very bad mobile game. Not Clash Royale, that's actually a good game. Shouldn't have spent as much money as I did on it, but, you know, it is what it is. I spent over a thousand dollars on Star Wars Galaxy of Heroes, which is a kind of JRPG-like squad-based affair. 
It's not very good. I don't know why I kept playing it for as long as I did, but I did. And you know what? I spent a lot of money on it. I opened a lot of boxes and I felt not only the dopamine release, but also the frustration when a box didn't give me what I want. This is something that's very rarely talked about. The concept of opening a box and getting something cool, yeah, it's a rush. But when you open a box and you don't get something cool, in fact, you actually get a bunch of junk, there are a couple of different ways in which you can react. Now, the same person would react by saying, this is a waste of my money, I'm not going to throw any more money at it. Those of us who maybe have certain addictive tendencies, on the other hand, would get frustrated and say, I have got to try again, because the next one, that's going to be the big one. That's going to give me what I want. And that's where it gets really dangerous. That's where it gets incredibly addictive. That's where it can become a problem for those with addictive personalities. And of course, for children in particular, who are very susceptible to the idea of flashing lights and pulling a lever and getting a reward. That's the sort of thing that these games have made absolutely no effort whatsoever to hide from kids. In fact, they've done the exact opposite of it. Frankly, I would argue that the ESRB needs to start to step in here. Because if they don't, eventually the US government, certainly in the United States, will, once they get up to speed on what's going on here. And they should be saying, look, if you include these kind of mechanics in these games, and you actually allow people to buy these packs for real money, these random blind packs engaged in what is essentially a form of gambling, then you should be jacking the rating of your game up to an M. The fact that Battlefront is going to be T-rated and yet has an in-game real money gambling system blows my mind. And how are they possibly getting away with that? Well, the answer is they're getting away with it because the US government and legislation hasn't caught up to it yet. But it certainly should, and we have seen on the mobile market predatory game after predatory game clearly aimed at children, aiming to exploit them, aiming to trick them into buying a bunch of items and crystals and god knows why. These games clearly aimed at even the youngest of kids offering loot boxes, offering premium currency. It's incredibly predatory. And the fact that we're seeing this slip into mainstream gaming now should be a concern. Now, this is not mere speculation. I am not simply throwing out these assertions off the top of my head saying, yeah, you know, these trigger the same sort of things as real gambling does. There are medical professionals that genuinely believe this as well. Uh, here's an example. Dr. Luke Clark is the director at the Center for Gambling Research at the University of British Columbia. A player is basically working for reward by making a series of responses, but the rewards are delivered unpredictably, he says. This was in an interview with PC Gamer quite recently. We know that the dopamine system, which is targeted by drugs of abuse, is also very interested in unpredictable rewards. Dopamine cells are most active when there is maximum uncertainty. And the dopamine system responds more to an uncertain reward than the same reward delivered on a predictable basis. Of course, this goes all the way back to the concept of the Skinner Box in the early 1930s, but that quote in particular is relevant to me because if you actually think that gaming companies were not fully aware of this, they were not fully aware that they could hook players in more with an unpredictable reward system versus a predictable one, then I think you might be a little naive. I mean, we've seen it used to completely innocent effect in... Things like, say, roguelike games that have different runs every time. Not only do they expand the replayability of the game, but they also give you a nice little exciting bit of a rush when you open a chest and get a certain item. You can see it in RPGs as well. Getting loot is exciting. Not knowing what that loot's going to be as you open that chest, that's entertaining. And I certainly find those games at their most compelling when I am receiving really cool, interesting, random loot like that. Now... Dr. Clark argues that games can exploit these particular instincts within people to a much greater and effective degree because they use, quote, overlapping variable ratio schedules. He explains that you're trying to level up, advance your avatar, get rare add-ons, build up in-game currency all at the same time. And what that means is there's a regular trickle of some kind of reinforcement that keeps you in the game. Compare that to, say, a slot machine where you maybe have a limited amount of money in order to play it, and once you run out of money, well, that's it. Games don't really have that. You know, you can keep grinding and grinding away. You can keep heading up 
that experience ladder. And I mean, a game like Overwatch, that experience ladder is never ending. And games much, much earlier than this have realized that unlimited leveling systems are actually, for some players, a way to keep them motivated to continue to play. The concept of prestige has been around since the Modern Warfare games. I, I always scratch my head, initially anyway, as to why anyone would ever prestige. Like, no, I unlocked everything. Why would I want to lose all of that? Well, for some people, it's the climb that really motivates them. And once they reach the top of the mountain, they feel less motivated to continue to play. Now, you combine that with a game that has the constant offering, the tempting offerings of loot boxes and packs, and you can see just how dangerous a system like that could potentially end up being. Everything about these systems is designed to be entertaining. Opening a box usually has an incredible audio-visual result, knowing that audio-visual stimuli are very important to enhancing that dopamine release. We've seen it for God knows how long on slot machines. The more impressive looking slots tend to get more people playing them. I know this, you know, I've been to Vegas. I tend to see a very impressive looking slot machine, maybe with a theme that I like that has really cool effects. And I go play it. I played the Plants vs. Zombies machine because I had a curved 3D screen and a theme that I was interested in. Whereas I was less interested in playing these penny slot machines that didn't look all that entertaining because they didn't have those audio-visual stimuli. Regardless of that, all these games are exactly the same. You don't do anything, you just press the button and see what happens. But there you can even see the key difference in a set of identical games, literally identical games. The ones that do better, in the eyes of certain people, are the ones that are most visually and orally appealing. Open a pack in Hearthstone. See the glows. Hear the wonderful... Oh, legendary! Every game I've played that has a rarity system has always had different sound effects associated with it. The color scheme is common, but the sound effects in particular... A game I'm currently playing, which I thankfully have not spent anywhere near as much money on as the others, is uh, Titanfall Assault, because while it does use a similar system to Clash Royale, the matchmaking works very well and the... Systems are less demanding, so I haven't felt like I need to spend as much money, but really There are definitely some people in that game that have I've encountered people with these like level 16 legendary Titans I'm like, well, there's no way you could have got this on your own. You would have had to have bought a lot of packs It's quite satisfying to beat those people into the dirt incidentally, but yeah, that game may be better balanced But even in that when I open a box and you get regular boxes every couple of hours just for logging in There's a different sound effect for each rarity and you're waiting for that specific sound for an epic or a legendary item. It's insidious. It gets inside your head. And these companies, oh, they know. They very much know. And that's where the biggest concern should lie. Blizzard has been resistant to the idea of telling people the rarities of certain items within loot boxes. Legislation in China briefly forced them to do so before they found a loophole. They actively tried to get out of it because they know taking away some of that mystique will take away some of the effectiveness of the loot box system when it comes to compelling people to use it. The fact that almost no company that offers a loot box ever gives the odds to anybody and actively obfuscates that particular information should be of great concern to people. What do you have to hide? Well, we know exactly what you have to hide because you feel that you can profit greatly if you do hide that information and that you may lose some money if you don't. So a conclusion. This is probably going to be the make or break year when it comes to loot boxes and what we're willing to accept. And unfortunately, I have a feeling it's going to be the break year. I would love to see people stand up against this kind of thing get as loud as possible, and see what can be done about it. I don't think we're going to get much done with Shadow of War, but with Battlefront there is an opportunity, because I genuinely do not believe that DICE actually wants to exploit players or make an exploitative system. But, unfortunately, they are at the whims of EA, they are owned by EA, they, re they, you know, they don't have a choice in the matter. It's easy enough to cast the publisher as the bad guy and the devs as the good guys, and you have to bear in mind that that's exactly what the publisher wants. If they can 
create a dissonance, if they can create a situation where a player will go after the publisher but say, well, I want to support the developer because they're good guys, so I'll accept this because of that. And I've seen people post that very thing, by the way, more than once. That is a attitude that has some prevalence. Then they will do that. They will happily take the heat so that they can get away with it. It doesn't really matter who's responsible. What matters is these systems are actively harmful to the gameplay experience. The Battlefront 2 system is flagrantly pay to win. To some extent, so is the Shadow of War system, but it just happens to be in a mode that the majority of people are not going to be playing. So to me, it's the Battlefront 2 system that we have the biggest chance of maybe getting changed and we should also be concerned about because it affects literally everybody. There is nobody that buys that game that goes into the multiplayer mode. Maybe you just play the single player campaign, but there is nobody that goes into that multiplayer mode that is not going to be affected by this loot box based progression system. It is impossible to avoid. And there, as far as I'm concerned, is the line. The line has been crossed in a pretty major way. The question is, what are we going to do about it? Well, the best thing we can do right now is make some damn noise and see where that goes. Because we have seen some people backing off. We have seen some companies reversing decisions. Very recently, in fact, with Forza 7, where they tried to sneak some nasty stuff in there. There was a big enough outcry and they backpedaled. Can we do it again here? Maybe. Don't underestimate the power of the consumer. Just because every boycott doesn't work, just because we don't get everything we want, doesn't mean that we can't necessarily get some of the things that we want. It is worth talking about this. It is worth protesting this. And it is worth, every time this happens, saying that same damn thing, no, this is not acceptable. There's the idea of outrage fatigue. We see a lot of that in the games industry in particular. We see it on sites like Reddit and 4chan and NeoGAF, where people are like, oh, I'm sick of hearing about this. Let's move on to the next controversy. Let's not actually do that. Because in this case, what we have is a controversy that is going to lead to worse games in the future if we don't continue to talk about it and actively resist it. My name's been Total Biscuit. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, by all means, do feel free to click the like button. If not, the dislike button is right over there. And I'll see you next time.